Hi, I'm Erin Hogan from the Art Institute of Chicago, and I am standing here with Jill Bugowski, who is part of the curatorial team for our new exhibition, Windows on the War, Soviet Task Posters at Home and Abroad, 1941 to 1945. We're here at the entry to the exhibition, and I feel like I'm standing in this line in Moscow in the 40s. So Jill, what are we looking at? What is a Soviet task poster, and what's the exhibition about? So the TAS studio was essentially a grassroots collective of artists who at the onset of the war, um, this began, this initiative began with the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany on June 22, 1941. These artists gathered together in Moscow without any kind of previously established studio or resources and decided from the ground up to build a propaganda studio that would make posters in support of the war effort. So the exhibition title, Windows on the War, refers not only to the fact that these are sometimes quite graphic depictions of battles, um, but also the fact that these posters were designed for storefront windows um, in Moscow. That's absolutely true. In fact, the posters are called TAS window posters. Um, that's built into um, their name because they were designed for these window wells and facades and are really quite um, large scale work. So much to talk about when we get in front of these posters. So why don't we just start at the top? I've always called this number 1000. We call it 1,000, too. <laughs> All the task posters are numbered, so they started out with task number one, which was produced in July of 1941. By the time this poster was produced, task 1,000, we are already in almost three years later, June of 1944. So the goals of the task studio um, were to produce almost one design per day. Wow. Um, so essentially, this is a, a huge, huge production line. The task posters were a really important collaboration between the writers of the day and the most renowned artists of the day. And so every task poster is captioned with a poem that was either written specially for the poster or even written in conjunction with the designs that the artists were producing. So here we have a poem by um, the writer Lebedev Kumak. And at the beginning, we have a quote um, from the futurist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky, who was really the um, ideological model and the artistic model um, that the the artists were looking to at this time. And the quote from Mayakovsky says, I want the pen to be on par with the bayonet. I can't help but notice as I walk around the exhibition that many of the posters and most of the Art Institute posters, you can actually see the lines of where the posters had been folded, which sort of gets us to why we came to mount this exhibition at the Art Institute in the first place. So the curators at that time were excavating a little used um, storage closet um, off of one of our galleries. They pulled out um, 26 tightly wrapped paper mailing parcels, um, as well as two large rolls of posters um, from the late 19th century all the way through World War II. So it was a huge poster collection that had been essentially forgotten about over the last several decades. So fundamentally, these posters had actually been mailed to the Art Institute as part of the Soviet Union's international campaign for cultural diplomacy. They came to the museum in the 40s, and somebody was like, mail from the Soviet Union and put it on this shelf. And decades later, um, you know, we sort of discovered what we had. Is it safe to call it 40s junk mail? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. In fact, it, it really was 40s junk mail because the works were essentially unsolicited. They were mailed from the Soviet Union by an agency called Vox, which is the USSR, Society for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries. And we, we don't believe that they were solicited. We believe that they picked um, some of the biggest art museums in the nation with the idea that these works would be shown, that they would be exhibited. Um, they wanted public exposure. They wanted people to, American audiences, to understand what was happening on the Soviet war effort and that hopefully this understanding would lead to material aid or economic aid or an advancement in the you know in the war progress by 1945 um, they had sent to us 157 posters so it was a, a remarkable discovery and then subsequently a remarkable conservation effort to get the works looking like this. If you could imagine finding a newspaper in your grandmother's attic from the 1940s. Oh, I can imagine that. It yeah. was, <laughs> the, the works were are extremely fragile, mm -hmm. um, even in the best of conditions. And, um, and I've so, read about your humidity chamber and, and all of that and about having to keep 
the works in a specific environment to just even be able to unfold them. Right. A lot of work had to go into um, getting the works in this condition for exhibition. But the benefit to that is since the posters had been folded since the 1940s, the colors are extremely rich because they had never been exposed to light. They mm -hmm. hadn't been exhibited in the last 50 years. So um, the, the colors are really amazing and the surface textures are really palpable. Well, this seems like the perfect opportunity to sort of talk about the revolutionary way that these posters were made. The medium that they decided to produce their posters in was stenciling. And stenciling is, is a very unusual choice for war posters because it is very labor intensive um, and kind of demanding on the production line, but it also enables them to make much bigger posters because they're not um, restricted to the paper sizes um, that lithography is, and it enables them to use many, many more colors in their posters than um, traditional lithographic processes. So one of the phenomenal things you've done for this exhibition is really completely deconstructed the stencil making process so everybody has a, a phenomenal idea of how difficult and complex this actually was. The Art Institute asked Alexei Petrov, um, a Chicago artist this year, to assist us in um, taking apart the color fields of this image and then cutting them out of stencils in the exact same way that they would have done it at the TAS studio. At the peak of this assembly line structure, of cutting and painting stencils, the studio had about 300 people working for them. And that's the artists that made the initial designs as well as a whole team of artists that did nothing but cut stencils, and then a team of painters as well as um, artists that worked on the glue and assembly process and technicians. A lot of these images are extremely comical and satirical. Um, some of the images are quite grisly and macabre. Um, there are dozens of Hitlers represented throughout the exhibition. And then there are also just sort of weird images <laughs> like the one that we're standing in front of now. What we see here are three historic um, knights. You have a medieval Soviet knight, um, a, a British knight, and almost a Paul Revere looking <laughs> Minuteman um, wearing an American flag draped over his shoulders. And together, they're fighting together to decapitate and defeat this multi-headed um, Hitler-esque serpentine hydra. Repeatedly you'll see the three flags waving together or the three armies fighting together um, to express the unity of the Allied forces in the 40s. At least here in this shining moment we have Paul Revere fighting alongside a medieval Soviet knight to defeat the classical reference of the hydra-headed <laughs> Hitler. Yes, it's, so. <laughs> it's an image that very much comes from Russian icons even, mm -hmm. or if you think about the images of St. George slaying the mm -hmm. dragon. The TAS artists in some ways have a lot more in common with uh, you know, art history and arts training than the kind of quick and dirty propaganda that's generally, mm -hmm. we think of as being generated on kind of a mass scale for mass dissemination. This, this doesn't look anything like that.